The following is a presentation of the Belly Up Sports Media Network. The Jake Paul Nate Diaz fight is going to be this weekend. We're very excited to talk about that, as well as the Pac 12 media deal with Apple. We'll get into some of the details over there. And also, while we're at it, is the Pac 12 completely dead? Most of us probably have the same answer, but we're going to discuss it anyways, as this is our Pac-12 week. And also some MLB trade winners and losers. We're going to take a look at both between the winners and the losers in the MLB. In the MLB. Of course, we've got our two-minute drill that we're going to be going through tonight, and we're going to start our top 20 players to watch out for in 2023-2024 season here in college football. We've got a lot of guys to touch up on, give you a little bit of a report on what to look for in this upcoming coming season. We've got all of this and much more today on Rising to the Occasion. What is up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Rising to the Occasion. We're so excited and so happy to have you along with us. Uh, we've got a lot of big things in the works, a lot of big things happening right now here at Rising to the Occasion, and we're so excited to have you guys along for the ride. We uh, might as well go ahead and start off by mentioning first our sponsor, and that is Mahler Bros. We have to first and foremost always bring up Mahler Bros Golf. It is an amazing company that you should absolutely do, do business with because you're helping this podcast directly because we are powered by Mahler Bros Golf. Mahler Bros Golf is an amazing way to get your golf polos, your t-shirts. We're going to be adding more hats to the uh, array of all kinds of golf apparel. So whatever kind of golf apparel you're looking for, we're trying to get it added in there. So if you're looking for it, go over there and check it out at MahlerBros.com. That's M-A-H-L-E-R-B-R-O-S.com. You can also find the first ever that we know of golf-themed coffee. It is the official coffee for golfers. But guess what? It's also good for people who just like coffee. So if you're looking for a great small batch coffee that tastes amazing to give away as a gift to somebody you love, go check it out. Uh, that is the best way to get your coffee and you help support us here at Rising to the Occasion as well as helping a small business grow. So go check out MahlerBros.com. That's M-A-H-L-E-R-B-R-O-S.com and you can get 10% off over there with the code RISING2. That's R-I-S-I-N-G-T-O and get yourself 10% off. So we're already giving a great deal on most of the stuff over there on the website. You might as well stack on top of that great deal and go check it out using code RISING2. That's R-I-S-I-N-G-T-O for 10% off at M-A-H-L-E-R-B-R-O-S dot com. Go check it out today. Turn heads on the golf course or wherever you are wearing Mahler Bros polos or t-shirts, whatever it is that you get over there. Mahler Bros Golf, you can look good to feel good. And of course, if you're feeling good, you're probably going to play good. So go check it out, Mahler Bros Golf. So it's MahlerBros.com. And again, use code RISING2. That's R-I-S-I-N-G-T-O for 10% off. And we also better mention something that's very new to us right now here at Rising to the Occasion. We have got a new Patreon account. Huge thanks to Blake for the tip on trying to get that started. We want to get more involved with you guys as our listeners. We've been growing. We're over 3,000 guys. I, I, don't, I don't know if we're two, 4,000 yet, but... Uh, I know we're, we're pretty close to it. Uh, so, you know, we've, we've been growing tremendously and it's a huge thanks to all of you guys. So how about you help support us a little bit more, you know, because we're trying to make this bigger than ever. We want to be able to, to write our own paychecks with this and stuff. So, you know, go over there and help us out. It uh, starts off, I think, at a dollar uh, and works its way up to, uh, to $8 to get a little bit extra with the $8 package. You get free merch and stuff. So, I mean, just go check it out because every every month we're going to be putting out new stuff. We're going to put out more content. We're going to give you behind the scenes stuff, all kinds of stuff. We're going to keep on brainstorming and thinking of ways that we can offer you guys more by going over there and becoming Patreons uh, and becoming a member. Uh, we're also going to have to think of a name for our, our supporters and everything, guys. But uh, I'm going to go ahead and bring in my co-hosts. Uh, I'll start off first with the man from down in Mobile, Alabama, Blake Lane. How you doing, man? What's up, fellas? Glad to be here. Uh, it's it's hot as hell down here, but we're making it, and I'm I'm always excited to sit here and talk about some college football, some major league baseball, uh, and whatever we got tonight. Uh, I know 
Mr. Jake Paul coming off his loss against Tommy Fury taking on Nate Diaz. So yeah, I'm ready to discuss it all, fellas. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, like you said, we've got all kinds of sports to talk about. Uh, and of course, for those who don't know, we have been setting a new schedule. So if you're watching this right now, you probably know the schedule or you're catching on because we're releasing on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 8.30 a.m. Central Time. Uh, so if you're in Central Standard Time, that makes it very easy for you. If you're Eastern Time, that's 9.30 a.m. We're going to be releasing an episode, and that's National Sports on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So tune in if you're a fan of all kinds of sports. But if you're a fan of college football, Jeremy tell them when, when to come and see us for college football saturday morning 8 30 a.m central center time and you do not want to miss it we got a big stack lineup coming this week and you do not want to miss it what more can i say so tune in at 8 30 and see what we got cooking yeah but jeremy how you doing man I'm doing pretty good, then. I'm really looking forward to today's episode. I know, as Blake mentioned, with the Jake Paul, Nate Diaz fight coming upon, that's going to be really interesting. Then we got some pretty amazing topics coming up in the two-minute drill involving Cooper Cup, Hunter Deckers, then um, even talking about a little bit about Kirk Cousins, but I'm not going to get full into detail. You just got to stay part of it and just listen and find out what we're going to talk about today. Yeah, yeah, guys, we've got a lot to get to, so we're so excited to have you guys along with us. So, guys, let's go ahead and jump into it like we've already previewed a little bit before. Uh, we've got Jake Paul going against Nate Diaz. I'll, I'll start us off with this one because I'm, I'm going to be totally honest. When the two Paul brothers first came onto the scene, I was not a fan. Uh, I was very hardcore against them. I just I couldn't stand them. I couldn't stand that you, you got a, a couple of YouTubers thinking they can fight. But then the more that I, I saw them fight, I realized, no, that's not just a couple of YouTube, uh, YouTube guys that think they can fight. It's a couple of YouTubers that can fight pretty well. Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll give it to them. They're, they're pretty good at what they're doing. And not only that, but they have been pulling the attention to themselves with all of this going on. And it's been a lot of fun to watch them. And we've even talked about both of the Paul brothers on this show in the past and kind of how... There's a lot of hate that goes into them, but you've got to have respect for how they've they've branded themselves and how they've put their brand out there and keep on growing their brand. So I'm extremely excited. Uh, when I look at this fight, I just imagine that Nate Diaz has to win this uh, just because he is a tough dude, and I don't see how you can knock him down. I don't think you're going to knock him out. And, and in, in boxing, it's pretty much a knockout or nothing uh, because, I, I don't know, I mean, I suppose if it comes down to a decision, I'm probably going to give it to Jake Paul because he's probably going to land more because Nate Diaz is just a sink, you know, let, let your your punches sink in and, and bloody me up if you need to. I'm going to I'm gonna feel just fine in the morning, so I don't care. Uh, you know, he's just, he's just too tough. And so I, I think that if it is a knockout, I think Nate Diaz knocks Jake Paul out, but I do think that this this could go down to a decision. If that's the case, then it's probably going to lean over towards Jake Paul because he's going to be much less bloody, and that, that means a lot whenever you're you're talking about the the judges. But Blake, what are you feeling about this this fight coming up this weekend? Uh, first thing I want to say, guys, is look, you can hate on the Paul brothers all you want to, but one thing you can't hate is their grind. All right, their grind from the Disney Channel to Prime Energy. Uh, to Jake growing his brand in the game of boxing. like You can't hate on any of it. They're just two guys that know how to make a lot of money, right? And Jake, uh, he lost uh, to Tommy Fury, right? He faced a a real boxer, uh, a guy that his brother's pound for pound the best boxer in the world right now, and, uh, you know, he he lost. He got beat. Uh, But that was his first go. At, at real at real competition in the sport uh and he, he what he's had five six fights total and people just say oh you know jake he's over with it's over like go back to youtube nah man step in there with nate diaz and 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 let's see what what he can do uh outside of the 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 octagon and in the boxing ring and and he's one of the greatest to ever throw hands in the ufc uh, that's one thing that I'm kind of worried about with this fight is we haven't seen it go well with UFC guys stepping into the boxing ring. Uh, it's a different sport. Uh, points are, are are judged differently, and I just want to I just want to see if Nate uh, can can withstand uh, some of the shots that he's going to take in 
in his older years. Now, this isn't the Nate Diaz that we were accustomed to seeing fighting Conor McGregor and everything and, and just, you know, taking an absolute beating, right? Uh, this is an older Nate. This is a, He's a little bit out of his craft right here. And, and I, I think Nate Diaz wins the fight, uh, but I am a little nervous to see uh, the damage that he takes because I know he cuts easily. Uh, with all the scar tissue and everything that he's racked up over the years. That kind of worries me a little bit. Like if if he cuts and it just gets out of control over the eye and blood's just, you know, uh, that's something that you got to worry about. So uh, I do think Nate wins the fight just because of his hands, man, and how quick he is. I don't, I don't know if Jake's actually ready for this. Uh, but I know it's been a hard transition for UFC guys to go into boxing uh, and, and, Look, a, a simple example of that was Connor. If you watched him fight Floyd, he was always wanting to hit Floyd in the back of the head, right? And and they would be like, "Hey, stop!" You know, like you can't hit in the back of the head. All right? That's the kind of stuff that I'm talking about. Is it's it's a different sport. It's a different game with different rules. All right. Yeah. It's also it's, it's also what, what are they? What ounce of gloves are they fighting with? Uh, I'm not I sure. I, I I haven't looked into that, but I would imagine probably t- ten ounce gloves. Yeah, probably ten. Yeah, um, I think Connor and Floyd fought with twelve ounce, if I remember right. So maybe maybe they move it up to a little bit and go to go straight to twelve. Yeah, I, I'm interested in to see Nate with that and everything. You know, the four ounce gloves is different. Uh, so definitely, um, I think it's gonna I think it's gonna be fun to watch. You know, I mean, if you if you want to rent it, rent it. Uh, if you don't. Catch it on a stream somewhere. Go to TikTok Live. They love to do it there. So yeah. No, we're we're not condoning any of the pirating, man. We're not we're not going to yeah. condone that, you know. But yeah. uh, but on the on the side note, off the air, yeah. Go ahead and go ahead and go find it over there. But yeah. Jeremy, Jeremy, how are you excited? Uh, how excited are you for this fight? I'm really excited. I was always a Nate Diaz fan when he was in the octagon, and come, hearing the announcement that he's going to be stepping back into the ring, not in the octagon, is definitely going to be a big transition just because i know we're always used to seeing the nate diaz throwing haymakers throwing kicks and throwing everything i wouldn't be surprised if he tries to throw one kick at least just because that's nate diaz's reputation because he's used to all the ufc stuff and i mean like i think what nate diaz's last fight was close to a year ago if i had to honestly guess i think it might what in september but like looking at the fight it's definitely going to be a fun fight of course, the stamina factor for both Nate Diaz and Paul won't be really a big beneficial factor, just because obviously you got two of these athletes that are used to having to conserve their energy, then know when to to get on the right step and go when time is needed. But like, it's just it's going to be weird going ten rounds for Nate Diaz, just because. He's used to going, if anything, maybe, what, three, five rounds at the absolute most. And, I mean, if anything, I give my – I'm still going to be benefit of the doubt. I'm going to still stick with Nate Diaz. But if it does last the full 10, I'd be kind of skeptical just because, like I said, you can never know if it goes in the 10 rounds. And for Nate Diaz, how much can he hold off in the tank to – to see if he can even make some points out of it. But if it goes 10, I can seriously see Logan Paul getting the victory. Yeah, yeah, I definitely think Logan, like you said, I think he would have more stamina when it comes to this fight because even in these five-round matches, whenever you see them in the UFC, given the UFC, I think, would take... I mean, personally, I feel like UFC takes more uh, breath out of you. It takes more stamina just because you're yeah. you're body-to-body the whole time and... Uh, and then also mm-hmm. running around where boxing is just all on your feet and you're not really re- allowed to grapple or anything like that. So it's definitely going to take more energy out of you to be in the octagon than in the ring. But uh, I-, I could be wrong on that, too. That's just my perspective. But, uh, you know, just just looking at it as a whole, I feel like I feel like Logan Paul, uh, he definitely will will probably have the advantage when it comes to stamina. And I, I think Logan Paul is faster, but I just don't see how you can can go I, I feel like if nate diaz clocks him a few times i mean we saw uh what happened to him it was, it was tyron woodley right that he, he fought against last logan paul yep yeah and, and jake. so 
Jake. Or, yeah, Josh. yeah, Jake, Jake, whoever Ooh, it is. Yeah. It's it's one yeah, of those yeah. those Pauls. They they Same look now. so alike too. They look like they could be twins. But uh, yeah, for Jake. So going against Tyron Woodley, like you you saw how how that power really affected him whenever he got hit. Uh, I feel like Nate Diaz is right up there too. He's got he's got power behind that hit, uh, and he's more elusive than what what he uh, shows too. Just because he's he, he's very very good. I think he's a black belt in jujitsu if I remember right. Uh, so you know just just knowing how athletic Nate is, even though he doesn't look it, uh, I think I think it'll be a, a really fun fight. It's it's kind of tough to decide exactly which one because. I think you got Nate Diaz stepping out of his comfort zone, but uh, it, it's going to be fun nevertheless. So I think it'll definitely be a, a fight to watch if you if you enjoy combat sports. Absolutely. But, uh, I want to throw this into factor. Nate Diaz is 10 years older than Logan Paul. Nate's 38, <laughs> Logan's 28. you think that will play a big factor into it too, being aged? I mean, it has to. I mean, I know Nate Diaz is in good shape for being his age, but... He, yeah, I mean oh, yeah, that that yeah, age yeah. difference, ten years. That's that's a big age gap, especially when it comes to yeah. fighting. Hmm. Like I can get maybe like one or two years, but this is ten years we're talking about here. That's huge. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it's going to be fun. Uh, like I said, I, I I'm excited for it. I really want to watch it this weekend. Uh, so I'll I'll be trying to tune in to watch just because I love any kind of fights like this, especially when they're big name fights like that, and you know they're pushing it because of the names. Uh, so I'll be tuning in for sure. But, guys, let's jump over to the Pac-12. We're excited to talk about the Pac-12 on Saturday. Again, like Jeremy said, it's on Saturday at 8.30 a.m. Central Standard Time, 9.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, where we talk all college football, and this week is our Pac-12 week. So let's jump in real quick just to talk about just the standing of the Big 12, right? Or sorry, the Pac-12 right now. I'm getting all kinds of names mixed up right now between similar <laughs> names. But we've got the Pac-12, which is really going to turn into the pac three here very soon it seems like but we've got the pac-12 media deal which came out a little while ago where it's it sounded like they were going to sign with cw which didn't make any sense at all and they got they got roasted for it but then we we hear some news today that they're trying to sign a deal with apple so i don't know if you guys heard anything about this but it sounds like the first year it's it's expected to be a relatively short contract uh, and it's going to start in 24 and 25 season, so next season. And then it's also relatively low to the league's hopes in terms of money. Uh, and so it sounds like they're not getting much money for this deal, but it's kind of an incentive-based deal that can get them more money with more subscribers. And if you look at the way that it's structured, too, they're going to have to get something like to compare to the other the other streaming platforms that that other conferences are on. They're going to have to get close to 30 million subscribers to to combat with you know the other conferences like the Big 12, SEC, ACC, and 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 Big Ten. So it's just crazy to look at this. And we we look over at the Big Big 12's new deal that they they just signed for. Uh, I think it begins in the 2025. Uh, that those schools will see an, an increase to about an average of 31.7 million based on that deal. Uh, and so to look at the Big 12 in comparison to what the Pac-12 is putting together, the Pac-12, it just seems like everything that they're doing is going in the wrong direction. And every every decision that they're making is just hurting the conference more and more. So guys, upon this, I mean, let's just start off with this and then also throw in the fact that the Big Ten is now looking to add Washington, uh, Oregon, Stanford, and Cal. So for sure, Washington and Oregon are in talks, and apparently Stanford and Cal may be trying to jump over as well. Uh, and this is all stuff that once you start to hear about it in the news, especially with the when it includes the Pac-12, it's most likely going to happen right now. Do we look at the Pac-12 right now? I mean, is the Pac-12 just totally dead? Uh, Jeremy, let's start off with you, man. I mean, honestly, I don't see the Pac-12 being much more here soon. Like, like you said, it's honestly going to become the Pac-3. Like, it's definitely going to be shifting over to all these, all these teams that are coming over. I can honestly see all four of those teams definitely coming over. Just, it's definitely deceiving for what the Pac-12 was to now, and everything just not going their way. Before, a lot of people used to watch the Pac-12, and now the Pac-12 is just honestly becoming the bottom of the barrel thing to watch. And 
even going back to the media deal, I didn't necessarily know about it until not that long ago. Then I happened to pull it up. I know um, some people believe the Pac-12 were offering. I think it was like a standard of like twenty million dollars. Like I think that might be per school. I could be wrong, but I'm not 100 percent sure. Like that's like ten million dollars less per year than the Big Twelve. Like what are you doing overall? At the end of the day, to have that much less, like I can understand if it's like half a million or even like a million. I know it's still a lot of money, but mm-hmm. that much amount of money is huge now these days. Like, what, yeah, what are you yeah, doing? I mean, it's it, it's crazy, and and you think of how the Pac-12 has been operating in comparison to obviously the SEC and the Big Ten are in the best standing out of any of the conferences. But Absolutely. the Pac-12 just seems to be going down. The Big 12 is making big moves, pulling over Colorado. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and there's even talks of other teams that the Big 12 is trying to get in. But, I mean, just looking at at the way that the Big 12 is operating, I mean, Blake, we've, we've talked about the Pac-12 and how it just seems like they're fading very quickly. Uh, how much longer do you see the Pac-12 sticking around? Uh, this year. <laughs> like, dead. It's dead. It's It's been dead. Like, Let's be honest, all right? <clears throat> when you don't play defense, people don't want to watch your conference. It's just nope. simple and plain. All right? You have to play defense. When you get into the playoffs and you lose by 30 and, you know, things like that, and, and you're you're playing Pac-12 after dark uh, and it's the final score is, you know, 59 to 56 or – whatever the case may be like like people don't really care to watch that brand of football um and like i mentioned a couple episodes ago the big 12 was on top of the ball when oklahoma and texas said they were leaving and they made the pac-12 look like and so the pac-12 really died when usc decided to go to the big 10 because that is your numero uno money maker in the Pac-12. They always have been. They're one of the greatest college football programs in history. Uh, And they decided to leave you because they said, hey, look, you're not cutting it. You're not getting it done. We're probably never going to win in this conference again. So uh, we need to get out. There's, you know, better opportunities in the Big Ten uh, to go over there and, and, uh, you know, even broaden our brand, you know, even more than what than what it already is. And so, uh, you're going to get USC and Ohio State and USC and Michigan, and uh, that is one reason why I said the other night that I wanted uh, Notre Dame to join the Big Ten is because I just think all of those brands in that one conference would be amazing. But I'm not sure if you guys remember me saying this about a year ago. I said that the future of college football was headed to uh, the North versus the South. And we were just going to be two big divisions. And we were going to have all of the other schools who got left out. We're basically going to drop down into like a G5 division. And they were going to play the South Alabamas of the world, the two lanes. And each division is going to have its own playoff. All right. So. I truly think you're going to have a G5 playoff and you're going to have a a P5 playoff. And and this thing is going to be two big conferences with 30 teams each or 40 teams each. And you're going to end up with like, you know, 12 teams a piece from each conference, each side, you know, and, and they're going to play it out and you're going to come down to the, the, this winner versus this winner head up in a national championship game. I think that's eventually how it's going to go. Uh, and and it looks like it's headed that way. Uh, there's no saving the Pac-12. They're dead. There's nothing that they can offer. They're going to cannibalize each other this year, and they're not going to make the playoffs once again. Uh, and you're just a sinking ship, man. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy because you think about, like you just mentioned, USC, and then we've got UCLA already – ready to go this is their last season in the pac-12 but then you're talking yep. about four more teams going uh, and then of course you've got colorado going over to the big 12 so there's seven teams total that you're leaving you you've got out the door already and like you said the big 12 
being ahead of them because not only did they add four more teams to the conference, they did it before Oklahoma and Texas were gone. So the yep. two teams that are, that are leaving are still going to play another season before heading over to the SEC and still got to play against those guys that are going to be replacing them. So it's not, and, and, and that's the other thing too, is that they didn't just replace those two teams. They added two teams on top of that. And so I think the big 12 is in really good standings for now until we do get to this kind of union versus Confederates kind of uh, look, you know, a whole civil war looking, uh, you know, but I, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting to say the least, just to see how everything's going to play out. And like I said, the other night, I'm just ready for it all to get over with so we can see what it's all going to look like. Um, but mm-hmm. You know, it, it's it's crazy to think of, of how the Pac-12 has just self-destructed from within. But with that said, when we talk about them on Saturday, there's a lot of excitement coming out of the Pac-12 this year because this is probably the deepest the Pac-12 has been in a very long time. And I think as tough as those teams are, when you talk about Utah and Oregon and Washington and USC – I don't know where UCLA is going to stand this year. I don't know where, where Oregon State's going to stand this year, but those are still a couple of teams that are going to push a good fight in that conference, but at least four teams that could really play nationally against any team in the nation and look pretty good. Um, but like you said, I, I, I agree with you. I think, I think the Pac-12 is probably going to beat themselves up too much where at least this year, it seems like the Big 12 did that a lot uh, and, and has yep. done that a lot, but at least this year, the the Big 12, they don't play everybody in the Big 12 this year. So maybe they still stand a chance if maybe in Oklahoma or Texas. And who knows, maybe TCU is still around and it ends up surprising everybody and, and comes back back out on top again. Maybe maybe K-State is is better than everybody's given them credit for, and they're going to come back out on top again. Whoever, whoever the case may be, I think the Big 12 stands a pretty good chance of being a better conference at the end of the season just because I think they – aren't going to beat themselves up the way that the Pac-12 is. But no, I, I totally agree with you. But guys, uh, just jumping over from the Pac-12, because again, like I said, we're going to talk about them more on Saturday. So make sure to tune in on Saturday morning. Wake up early with us. Get yourself a nice cup of Muller Bros coffee and get going in the morning with us because we want to talk Pac-12 with you guys and give you guys our predictions for this year because that's our predictions for the Pac-12 going in the future after this year. But on Saturday, we're going to talk about this season, what the, what's going to go on in the Pac-12 of this season. But let's jump over and talk a little bit of MLB right now because I want to talk about what's going on in the MLB. We just had a lot of trades going on in the MLB. We've got some winners and losers that we have got to bring up. And guys, it's 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 one of those trade deadlines that really didn't bring us the excitement. Blake, you and I were talking about this, I think, in the group chat the other day. I didn't see any moves that I was like, oh, dang, like this, this was a big move for them, you know, and I, I did, I just didn't see any of it. Uh, so we're going to kind of go through here. Uh, for some reason, my note isn't pulling up on that one, but I've got some winners and losers I want to go through real quick. Let me see if I can pull it up on my phone because it's not really loading on the, uh, the computer there. But, yeah, Josh, I'll tell you the biggest loser yeah, Who's is that? the New York Mets. The New York Mets, I mean, go, with, go with it. Yeah, uh, you, you you get Verlander and you get Scherzer, and now it doesn't work out. And uh, you you ship your closer in the middle of the night. Max Scherzer finds out about it, and he says, "Hey, look, we need to have a talk." They go into the to the uh, clubhouse and they sit down and they start discussing things. and And the Mets tell him that they're really uh, just not worried about twenty twenty four or twenty twenty five. This is a, a a showcase for 2026. Well, Max Scherzer is going to be 40 plus years old in 2026. Like he's not trying to hear that. He's trying to win a World Series right now. So Max Scherzer was like, "Hey, get me out of here." All right. So they say, "Okay, well, we'll get you out of here. Uh, let's send you down to Texas." And then Justin Verlander sitting there going, "Hey, look, you brought me in here to to uh, match up with with Mad Max and win a World Series. Now that he's gone, you need to get me out of here. I want to go back to Houston. So now he's in Houston. I think that was a big win for the Astros. They're uh, steadily on the on the uh, Rangers' heels and catching them. And then you add uh, a, a World Series MVP uh, guy like Justin Verlander and everything that he's done, the Hall of Famer that he will be when his career is done. I think that's big time in that rotation. He's familiar with that clubhouse. They've done it before. They're World Series champs. Uh, so I really like that move. But the Mets, 
are a disaster. The Mets are a disaster. And uh, I know their farm system got better and everything because of this. But if I'm if I'm Francisco Lindor, man, I'm I'm also going in and saying, hey, look, I don't want to be stuck here for two more years, and I'm one of the best infielders in the game, and and you're basically saying that we're tanking for two more seasons before we're competitive again, uh, while we're just letting the Braves run away with the division, and and now the Phillies are are kicking us and beating us down. So like, what the hell is going on, man? The Mets are a dumpster fire. They're trash. Uh, they got to fix some problems over there. Yeah, I like that you brought them up, too, and you covered it really well. So, I mean, yeah, they, they were definitely on my on my list of losers uh, and, and just looking through. But, I mean, Jeremy, do you do you have any any big losers that, that you can think of for the MLB trade deadline or anything? I don't mean to put you on the spot if you don't have that. anything. I don't know how to top that, but, I mean, I also yeah. have the Baltimore Orioles as a loser. I like it. Like, okay. With what with what they were doing, I understand they're, a, they're another first place team like the Rangers, but they're also unclear of what they really want to do. Like they were coming into the trade deadline, not really necessarily having an idea on what they want to do. Then I know they were really um, to the world like they have more prospect depth to trade in any other contender. So like the Orioles have so many good young hitters that. They can't even play all of them together. It's a problem. Is a problem. Like you get all these good players, and obviously getting in that rotation and trying to find time to get on the field is it's not the easiest thing. Like you gotta be patient. But like my honest opinion, the Orioles weren't really smart with this entire situation, and that's how I just honestly feel about the ball. I've never really liked the Baltimore Orioles, and then once I saw what they did during the trade. I really wasn't a big problem. Yeah, I, I like that you brought up the Orioles because that was one I wanted to ask you guys about because it feels like they won because they add, add a Jack, is it Flaherty? Is it Flaherty? I don't know how to say his name. Jack Flaherty. Flaherty. Okay, so I had it right the first Flaherty. time. But, I, I mean, I, I really like that move because I was looking into him and, and what they added with him. I think that's really big. But I do kind of agree with you, Jeremy. I think that they could have added more. So I'm glad that you brought up the Orioles because that was one I wanted to ask you guys about is whether you view them as a winner or a loser because I've, I've heard both sides and looking it up, you know, I, th- I, think, I think adding Flaherty to the, to the roster was really good. But I feel like there was more moves when, when looking into it. I think there's more moves that they could have made. And I don't, I don't know exactly where that would have been. But I think just adding numbers right now could have could have really helped them and, and maybe a couple of those those key areas that they really could have. Uh, so I, I, I like that you bring them up. The yeah. the reason the reason I don't think they added anything else is because their winning is not this year. I know they're in first place. I know people have fallen in love with the Baltimore Orioles, but their time isn't now just yet. Okay. Now they made a pe- they made a nice little piece with Flaherty there, and and that's going to work out well, but. Their their time of winning is not. It's just look. They're still young. They're super young, and I don't think they wanted to lash out and make some type of trade. And they look back in the rearview mirror and go, "Man, we gave up our farm system, and that didn't really work out. And now we were in a big position to win for years to come, and now we're just kind of stuck back to where we used to be." Uh, so. I get why they were conservative and they didn't want to just lash out and make a trade uh, because I really think next year is their year. I think that's when the Baltimore Orioles are going to go all in. They're going to push the poker chips all in and they're going to say, hey, this is our year. We're here to win it. So uh, I would have I would have loved to seen them go in and, and make a trade, but I understand why they didn't and they just yeah. kind of held off a little bit. I like that, yeah. and and I, I do think it's funny that Blake brings up the Mets being a Yankees fan and not wanting to look at, at his own team and seeing what's going on over there because I personally had the Yankees as my biggest loser um, only because I look over at the Yankees. No, I don't think they needed to really offload talent. I don't think they needed to bring in a whole lot of talent, but looking at what what's, what's going on this year, they just have underperformed tremendously. Uh, and, and looking at it, I feel like really all that they brought in was kind of a mid-level reliever uh, and uh, Keenan Middleton. And then they also brought in a pitcher as well. Uh, and I don't have, have him written down. Was it Howard? Um, Spencer Howard, right? And so they, they brought uh, in a couple of guys in the trades, right? But other than that, 
I mean, I just haven't, I didn't see too much that really seemed like it helped the the Yankees get out of the rut that they've been stuck in for so long. I mean, you can go ahead and combat that and be mad at me all you want, Blake. <laughs> No, I was just about to go off on the Yankees. Uh, th- okay. That was gonna be that was gonna be my next team that I was gonna go off. Uh, I think it's to the point with the New York Yankees where you have to fire Brian Cashman. I know you just signed him to a new deal and everything, uh, but for you to not make a move at the trade deadline when you were still, even though you're in last place in the AL East, you were only three games back of the AL wild card yeah. at this point of the season with 60 games left and you don't make a move. You're the New York Yankees. All right. You have 27 world titles. You are the mega of, of professional baseball and you don't make a move. You sit back and, and you do nothing. Hal Steinbrenner, sell the team brother. Because your dad is rolling in his grave right now, watching the disaster that you have created. Now, they've underperformed this year because Michael King hasn't been what he was last year out of the bullpen. Uh, Seve has been absolutely terrible. Ship him to the sun. Uh, Domingo Herman, he's dealing with alcohol issues. He just got suspended for the rest of the year. Uh, Aaron Judge has missed three quarters of the season. Like, Josh Donaldson is retire, man. Look, I know you're you're you know Mobile, Alabama, and and uh, you played right here at Faith Academy, uh, but you went to Auburn. I love that. I'm a huge Auburn Tiger, but uh, I think Josh's time is over, and I just it didn't work out in New York. Uh, he had phenomenal years in Major League Baseball. Uh, he he won an MVP, and for and for Josh to win an MVP as a former Auburn Tiger, I think that's huge. But he's not a Yankee, all right? DJ LeMayhew has sucked this year, all right? We're not used to seeing that. Giancarlo Stanton and Josh Donaldson's contracts combined, they're hit. They're both hitting under, what, 200? Uh, get out of here. Uh, it's just it's a team that can't hit. Bader can't hit righties. I think he's hitting like 225 off of righties. Yeah, he's hitting 360 off of lefties, but how many times do you see a lefty? I'm sorry. I'm breaking down the whole lineup. Anthony Rizzo went like 50, what, 50 something games without an extra base hit or something like that. I mean, get out of here, man. This team, they can't hit. They can't pitch. All they got is Garrett Cole right now. Um, uh, what's his name? Uh, that come from the Giants. Uh, the lefty Carlos Rodon, uh, he sat out half the year with with back pain. I mean, goodness gracious, dude! You got paid over a hundred million dollars, and you're complaining about poor little back pain. Uh, and then he come he comes in and he gets his tits ripped every time. I mean, he gave up two bombs last night, I think it was, and then he wants to blow kisses to the New York crowd and everything. Like, get out of here, man! The Yankees are trash. Fire Hal Steinbrenner. Uh, fire. Uh, Brian Cashman, get them both out. George Steinbrenner, if if you got to go dig him up out of the grave, all right, go do it. Because the Yankees died back in 2010 when he took his last breath. And I stand on that because you've sucked ever since. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. Go off. And I do want to make one correction. You said wow. You said that you don't see too many lefties, but you're outpowered right now by two lefties. So, I mean, just <laughs> the, dominant, the, dom- the dominant pitchers in the game are no, right-handers. No, I, yeah, I know, I know. Yeah. I'm just teasing you, but yeah, you got oh, yeah, you got I'm... two you got you got two lefties on the on the podcast with you right now, though. So, oh, anyway. yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I always think it's funny because we we went uh, we went uh, bowling once. It was my wife and and my wife and I went with our in laws. And so my wife, my mother-in-law, and I are all three lefties, and then my father-in-law is a righty, and and he was the oddball out being a right-handed, uh, you know, bowler. And so I just thought that was funny. That's but, like it's super rare, and people like try to teach their children uh, to throw left-handed because it's so rare. Uh, but it's it's a it's a hidden gem in the game of baseball. When you see a lefty throwing 96, 97 miles an hour, they're gonna get more attention from scouts and everything uh, because they're gonna they look at hey that's very very unusual that you see something like that. I played college ball uh, with a guy. Uh, his name was Brett. Um, his name he got drafted by the Minnesota Twins uh, back in twenty. 10, I believe it was. Uh, I think it was like the 13th round or something like that. Um, and and he, he got up to like high A, 
maybe maybe a little double A ball, but he was a lefty man, and, and he come in from high school. He was throwing like ninety three, ninety four. Ended up getting up to about ninety five, and uh, he got drafted, and he made a little bit of money doing it. So, uh, yeah, but the Yankees suck, dude. Just as simple <laughs> as playing. No, I'm glad we brought them up. But can we all agree on who the MLB trade deadline winners are? Uh, and I know, I know, uh, Blake even mentioned them just a little bit, I believe. But I mean, we can probably all agree that it's it's the Texans, right? It's mm-hmm. it's 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 for sure the Rangers uh, and the Astros. Uh, uh, yeah, sorry, I said were, Texans, but yeah, Texas Texas Rangers. That's what I meant. Yeah, yeah it's Texas Rangers and the Astros and uh, the Braves are the best team in baseball. <laughs> all right, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, I mean, I just just looking over at what they were able to to accomplish here late too, uh being able to get that verlander astros uh reunion uh i mean that was that was one big thing that you can look at um but just seeing everything that the rangers have been able to do i think that they've been the big deadline winners um just because you know looking looking at all of it i, I think you know jordan montgomery uh how how good he is um i, I don't know i just i look at everything that the, that the uh, rangers have added uh let's see they they uh, God, let's see, there was, a, yeah, there was a, yeah, they they pulled in the guy from Kansas City. I'm looking through my list real quick. Uh, it was, uh, Arldis Chapman. Uh, so they they pull in a, pull in. yeah, he yes. he went from the Yankees to the Royals, and and now he's with Texas. Yeah, so now seeing seeing them pull him in, I think that was a big one. Uh, they also got a catcher, uh, Jonah Heim. Uh, and so, uh, you know, with, with they were or, uh, sorry, they, they got uh, another defensive guy, too. But I'm trying to think of who it was. They, I, I've got just the names pulled up and I, I wasn't smart enough to put all of the, the position and, and positions and stuff next to him where they came from. But uh, no, what if just, we got the baseball guy up there, he can help us out. Yeah. What, if, what if Jacob deGrom could could have actually stayed healthy? Yeah, that that yeah. would have been big. That would be you, huge all that money and you bring him there and you really didn't know if you were going to get Max Scherzer you know you didn't know that uh and now that you've got him man if DeGrom could have stayed healthy this is a this this would have been a World Series uh contender I mean obviously I still think they can compete for a World Series but if Jacob DeGrom stays healthy and you add a Max Scherzer at this point in the year I mean goodness man because if you get a Corey Seager that's healthy and and you get a Marcus Simeon in up the middle the, in that two B shortstop role right there up the middle. Uh, those are two of the best in the game at what they do. So uh, this team this team's deadly, man. They can score, they can hit, uh, they hit for power, they play really good defense. Uh, you know, they just uh, they got to hold off the Astros. The Astros are they're champs, man, and and they've yeah, they been are. there before. when it gets tight. They're they're. Uh, used to the the big time bright lights, so it's going to yeah. be a heck of a run in the second half. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a lot of fun. Uh, the guy I was thinking of was Austin Hedges from Pirates. Uh, so them bringing him over, he's he's a big defensive guy. So I think that can really help their defense out a lot. Uh, I, I don't know. I just I, I mean I, I saw a huge list from them, and I'm like, man, that's that's a that's a win right there. When you can add that many guys through trades. Uh, and, and seeing what they gave up to get these guys in, it, it just seemed like they really won the trades. I feel like the Rangers, uh, they're uh, they're they're head head and shoulders above everybody else when it comes to how good they were able to to accomplish all the trades. But uh, guys, anything else on winners and losers for the ML, MLB trades? I think we covered uh, it, but yeah, I mean we we did. A... I'll tell you a loser. I'll tell you a loser. Who's that? Uh, the Anaheim Angels for not trading Shohei Otani because he's going to walk in the offseason and you're going to get absolutely nothing for him. So, yeah. loser. Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, I mean, I just, it just, was, it was really crazy to see so many big names pop up as trade bait that, like you and I were talking about, like it was just so dead. And mm-hmm. I mean, it was, it was disappointing because there were so many teams that I was looking at waiting and we wanted to talk more baseball this year. But whenever we have big headlines right in front of us, they're not popping up, you know, and it's just, it sucks to see that. But guys, let's no. jump over. We're going to do our two minute drill next. But before we do, let's bring up, because we have to t- and take a, another pause real quick. Before we jump to our, our sponsor, I first want to remind everybody again we've got a Patreon now. So we want you guys to become uh, members of 
the Rising to the Occasion group and, and show your support to us by signing up over there. That link is in the description, so please go check it out. It's a huge help. Uh, you guys have, have done so much already, and so if you don't want to pay to do that, at least do us the, the, the very least. Make sure that you are following us on social media, uh, which just takes one easy click, and share. Uh, you know, if you can, that's that's a huge way to help if you're already subscribed. If you're not subscribed, all you have to do is hit that subscribe button. And if you would like, if you like this episode, go ahead and hit that like button. That's a, a great way to help us out and you don't have to do too much. You don't have to pay anything. Easy going. But if you want to help support us financially, we've got some sponsors and stuff that have been helping out. But you can help financially directly out of your pocket by going over and joining with our Patreon. That link is in the description down below. So by the time you're seeing this, that is live and ready to go. So please help us out because, like I said, we're trying to we're trying to give you guys more content. So if you become a Patreon, if you become a member, uh, then you you get all kinds of extra content. We've got three tiers. I believe it's just a bronze, silver, and gold. We might end up changing up the names to see. If something else fits the show better but before we go further and go into our two minute warning uh, you know and 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 talking about or sorry that the two minute drill I, I called it the wrong thing but i want to stop and talk about something that all of us need and that's energy all right we need the kind of energy that helps us stay on top of our game the kind of energy that helps me stop mispronouncing things and, and calling things the wrong names and stuff like that. We need more energy throughout the day. And that's where built bars come into play. Built bars aren't your typical protein bars. They're nutritious, packed with protein. And guess what? They're amazing. They taste amazing. And you can call it magic, but it's true because it's hard to find a protein bar that tastes as good as built bars do. They've got a range from enticing flavors from salted, uh, started, uh, salted caramel. See, I told you I need the energy that built bars can give me. You've got salted caramel, coconut, even cookies and cream. So you've got all kinds of amazing flavors. Guys, you don't want to miss out on all of this because guess what? They're also coated in 100% real chocolate. All right, so whether you're working out, you're, ha you're hiking, uh, you're, you're chasing after the kids, uh, maybe you're podcasting like we are, maybe you're, you're getting ready for a tailgate, getting ready for a big game, whatever the case is, no matter what you're up to, Built Bars are the perfect companion to keep you energized and satisfied. And so without putting all these extra sugars and sketchy additives into your body, you can try out Built Bars and add some amazing protein uh, and, and just great energy that you get from them. And just for being our loyal listeners, we want to let you guys know that we partnered up with them and we've got a great deal for you. You can go over to Built.com, that's B-U-I-L-T.com and use our code, that's RISING2, R-I-S-I-N-G-T-O, and you'll get a whopping 10% off these amazing protein bars. So you're already getting a great deal from an, from an amazing company that has amazing products, but we're going to give you 10% off what they're already offering you. So again, that's all one word, rising to, that's R-I-S-I-N-G-T-O. So you can go check it out, 10% off at built.com. Go ahead, unwrap your first built bar experience, or if you're a seasoned fan, try out a new flavor. Trust me, with built bar, you can feel and you, you can fuel yourself up and it will be extremely delicious. Now let's get into the two minute drill. We've got to kick it over to Jeremy to get us going. Jeremy, what do we have for the two minute drill today? All right, starting off, we got Cooper Cup injured in practice. I know Rams spokesman, I know they were saying it was a hamstring injury and the injury, however, is expected to impact the availability when the Rams open the regular season against the Seahawks. Josh, do you think this is going to come back and bite him, or do you think he's going to be okay? Man, it's tough. Uh, I think the Rams, when you look a couple of seasons ago and how they were Super Bowl contenders throughout the whole season, bringing in Matthew Stafford, bringing in OBJ, and then obviously that, I, think that, I think that was the same season that they brought in Von Miller. Um, so, I mean, mm -hmm. their, their defense was looking stacked. Uh, and then if obviously they, they, they still had Aaron Donald over there. They had a lot of young guys, too, that really helped chip in and, and did a lot for that team. And then, of course, you have Cooper Cup have that, that huge season. Last year, a little bit banged up. Uh, really, the whole squad was. And it just seemed like nothing was going together. I truly think you need Cooper Cup to be healthy for that team to really shine just because he is your number one receiver. He is, is going to be your number one receiver. And so you need that number one for your number two to kind of sneak in there and, and, and take some, some spotlight away. And I think that's Van Jefferson. Um, but 
I, I think you need that 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 one two punch between Matthew Stafford and, and that receiving core out there, and I think Cooper Cup's a big part of it. So I think if he's not completely healthy, one hundred percent healthy by the, by the beginning of the season, then it does it does hurt a lot. I think that that kind of gives it it delivers a big blow. So I think Cooper Cup has to get healthy. Hopefully, this is something that that he's able to shake off and get back on his feet. But uh, I mean, even at that, I don't think he's going to be one hundred percent healthy. Yeah, absolutely. I was kind of in the same thing. But Blake, do you have anything to cap it off? Uh, I'm the same way. I think this is going to be a lingering uh, injury. I think it's just going to nag him throughout the season. A hamstring is pretty difficult to come back from. Yeah. Uh, it, it's a six-week deal to kind of even see if you're 100%, honestly. And then uh, it's something that if it doesn't get back right, man, it just lingers around and, and you tweak it here and there. And uh, so – you know, uh, I think it, it, as much as he's been banged up here recently, I think it's going to linger around, and I just don't see the Rams being contenders this year. So, absolutely, that makes me feel better being a Bengals fan. But um, going on to topic number two, uh, this one kind of hit close to home just because it's not far from me and Josh. Iowa State quarterback Hunter Decker's accused of gambling, and I'll read you guys this off before. He is being accused of play, placing 366 mobile or online bets from his personal phone, totaling more than $2,799, including 297 bets when he was under the age of 21. First off, gamble responsibly. Josh, what the heck is he doing? I mean, we're we're big we're big gambling guys, right? We like we like putting a wager. Yeah. We, we we got that's why we got bro throw. I mean. I mean, you, first of all, you have to do it legally, you know. So that that's one thing, and and second off, you have to be responsible with it. I don't I don't know. I mean, I don't think that the number of bets is what says it was irresponsible. I've heard some people saying, "Wow, that's a lot of bets," but let's be honest, we probably put that much in ourselves, uh, you know. So I mean, I don't think the number is what what co- counts it as responsible. But when you know that you've got you've got rules to abide by and you're you're going against them mm-hmm. you know what's going to catch up to you you know that they've been looking out for this i, I mean dude you you've got you've got a, a big a big season ahead of you and you might you might be taken off the field for this so i mean you got to think about not just yourself and your your own well-being but think about your team too they they're relying on you so i think you have to be smarter with it uh, I, lo- I don't ahead, i don't please. think I don't think that uh, there is a, a might be taken off the field. I think he is done. Uh, well, right right now he's just being accused, so that's why I say might be. But yeah, I uh, agree with you. Yeah, I, I think uh, I think he is. Uh, I think he's on his way out the door. And hey, uh, up up that way, man. Is that all y'all have to do up there? Like, like y'all don't have any other activity? Because I feel like all the kids in Iowa are getting busted for. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's a big I mean, thing in Iowa right now. Between <laughs> Iowa and Iowa State, we, we were just talking about that. Jeremy and I were the other, I think, yesterday or something like that. Like, yeah, this this was a big yeah. thing where all this was ha- happening over yeah. there in Iowa and Iowa State where I think it was like something like, I know it was double digits, like 28 oh. different kids or something like that were involved in this. And so now yeah. now Hunter Decker is being one of them. I mean, that's that's big for their program. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 Go ahead, Blake. I'm sorry. No, no, you're good. You're good, Jimmy. Uh, just, just be more responsible, man. It was kind of like the other night when I was talking about the the drinking and driving stuff. Look, you're underage. You don't need to be gambling in the first place, uh, you know. Because <laughs> look, if you don't gamble responsibly, it can get you into a hole, uh, and then uh, you're going to be in some trouble. So, do you, do you have to be 21 to gamble? Is that right? Uh, I know here in Alabama, you can't even walk into the casino like. Uh, That's what I if thought it was. If you're, the, if you're under the age of 21, like you, there's a green line that goes through the casinos. Well, the state of Alabama doesn't have casinos um, unless it's on the Indian reservations. Uh, but when you go to Mississippi, Biloxi, Mississippi, there's a green line that goes through the casinos. And if you're under 21, you have to be uh, uh, with a parent and you have to stay on that green line. If you step off that green line, they are on you like white on rice. I and, guess uh, I guess I never I never really got into gambling like sports gambling or anything until I was like 24. So it was just I don't know that was just something weird to me. 23 or 24 is whenever I started. So I just wasn't sure on on what sports gambling was, but you know what the age limit was. But 
I, I assume it's it's 21 because you're right. Whenever you go into a casino, you got to be 21. But yeah, yeah. Well, in the state of Alabama, sports gambling is looked down upon. It's frowned upon, and uh, you're the you know you're just a a bad person if you sports bet in the state of Alabama. I guess. So. <laughs> well, what are you gonna do? I mean, sorry for Alabama, but I mean. Up here in Iowa, I mean, we don't have much, as we all can tell. Um, <laughs> going on to next, going on to our next topic: ex Northwestern lineman Raymond Diaz alleges racial mistreatment. Now, reading into this, I know this is something that we shouldn't even have to be dealing with, like race. We shouldn't have to be even making comments like this. Then it, we're all grown adults here, Blake. Mm-hmm. Obviously, I know we've all been in a, in a college locker room. I know there's going to be things that have been said and things that shouldn't even be brought up. Mm-hmm. Looking at this kind of a situation, what do you think overall of this entire situation? Uh, what What did he say that was said or, or happened? Well, and, and keep, what, it, keep it PG, but, I mean, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What, was, what was said – it was subjected to hazing that included mocking of his Mexican heritage along with microaggressions from comments made by former old line coach Brett Ingalls. I'm, I'm probably butchering his name, but um, – and they were as sexualized acts and have been previously alleged by other former players. So it's not and just this, one in particular person. Yeah, and this was at where? Northwestern. This was yeah. Northwestern. Well, we are – man, that's the big ten. We already know what kind of energy they bring. Uh, th- you know, they were dry-humping people in the locker room and stuff. And so, uh, look, the the place uh, for coaches to make fun of people's uh, race, religion, or whatever like that, man, that, that is uh, – it, it's wild to me uh, that you would even go there, right? Yeah. Um, I just, I know there's hazing and stuff that goes on in a locker room. Uh, I know when I played in college, I played a little baseball in college, and uh, there was some things that went on in the locker room, and I just kind of looked and was like, man, you know, that's not right. Um, I just want to say to like college kids, man, like you, like you don't always have to haze people and and try to make people do things uh, that that they don't want to do. All right, and then. Uh, as far as like the racial stuff and everything like that, um, you know, just stay to yourself, man. Like, 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 it, you don't have to go attack people because of what they look like or, or you know, or where they're from or whatever. Like, who cares, man? You know, you, let 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 you know you and him be boys and 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 all of that skin skin color and all of that stuff, man. And and it's just nonsense. Like, it, it gets under my skin. Uh, that that people uh, in 2023 are, are still stuck on that stuff. Like they're still being raised to talk about it and and make fun of people about it and everything like that. It's just wild to me. Like I, I can't get down with it. Neither can I. I mean, like of course we all see on social media like acts like this. Like it's just sickening. And then Josh, I mean, do you have anything else really to comment on upon the situation? Yeah. Yeah. I mean. <laughs> When I, when I look at this, I don't want to call him a liar because I don't know what happened. I, I wasn't there. But, I mean, for one, you're accusing something pretty pretty big. I mean, let, let's be honest. To, to accuse somebody of racial slurs and stuff like that, that that's very big. So, I mean, I, I see – because I had to pull up the article real quick uh, that we were referring to, Jeremy, and it was that he he, made, he says that there was – uh, there was times that there was racist, embarrassing, degrading, and harassing remarks towards him and other players. And so there's even a lawsuit brought up about this. Uh, and he also said that there was a, a longtime Northwestern uh, assistant who's still at the program, uh, Matt McPherson, who witnessed all of this and took no action on it. And so, I mean, I'm just looking at this. I know that there was some stuff going on there in Northwestern. Uh, and so obviously there was some hazing and stuff, but... To accuse somebody of, of stuff like you're racist and, and degrading and all this harassing remarks, just be careful that you're not 
you're not accusing somebody and ruining their career if this isn't 100 true so i don't know yet I, I believe in innocent until proven guilty uh, i think you're going to you're the one that's making these accusations so you're going to have to bring the proof uh and hopefully this is dealt with properly uh if it if it is false hopefully it gets proven wrong uh and then if it's true, I, like what Blake said, I think he said it really well. And you know, this is something. Can we not just get over all of this stuff? Can we stop? Uh, because yeah. I don't, I don't understand. You know, like I, I don't understand why even if something's said, like there's been times where I've said something, and it has nothing to do with race, and it gets brought up as somebody saying it's racist. You know, we've we've probably all heard this, and and it's just it's crazy that that in today's culture, everything is 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 brought up that way. Where can, can we just put that aside and all just get along, you know? And I don't, I don't get it. Uh, yeah. But hopefully, the right thing gets done there. And Northwestern's got to get their act together because uh, they're they're having no. all kinds of stuff come out. Absolutely. And once I heard that it was against with Northwestern, I thought, oh man, not again, because they really add themselves into an injury thing. Yeah. But going into our, going into our final topic, two minute drill. Vikings Kirk Cousins goes all in while uncertain for his NFL future. The 35-year-old QB returning, however, is uncertain that his team isn't sure that they want him back. Blake, I know Minnesota has had their their fair share of ups and downs. Do you think this could be the final hurrah for Kirk Cousins? Yeah. Yeah, I do. Um he hasn't won enough in the league, man. And uh, you you got to win the games that matter in the playoffs, and he just hasn't done it. Yeah, he, he's always come off to me as just a serviceable QB that can get you to a playoff, get you to a wild card game, but nothing more than that. Um, and he's going to win you 10 games, you know, and, and he's going to set you up in a wild card, and then you're going to lose. And uh, even when they were the best team in the league, a couple years ago, they were one of the best teams in the league. They get in the first round and they get waxed. So, like, mm-hmm. he just he doesn't produce enough at a high level for me. And I think the league is getting better. He's getting older, and I think his time's coming to an end for sure. Yeah, and even Josh, I know looking at Kirk Cousins, like looking when he first came in the league, going to the Washington Redskins or whatever you want to call them. Um, I know, obviously, during that time, RG3 being QB number one, then he definitely had a good person to look up to and follow in his footsteps. But mm-hmm. do you think it's it's finally time for his cousins to maybe hang it up? Yeah, I mean, it, it's tough because I, I'm not all about all the Kirk Cousins hate. I, I think... I think he is a good quarterback. I, I like how Blake put it. I think he's a serviceable quarterback because he can be put. He's the type of quarterback that you can throw in just about any system, and he's going to provide good numbers for you. Uh, so I don't yeah. think he's the type of quarterback that only thrives in one system where and one system only. He's he can. I, I suppose that's not totally true. I, I'll say any NFL uh, system because I don't think the NFL runs a whole lot of RPO, even though we're starting to see see some of that change. Uh, especially with some of these these faster and more athletic guys. But for the most part, he can fit in a lot of different systems, and I think he's serviceable just about in every system. So I like Kirk Cousins. I think he's a really good guy, too, and, and I know Blake brought that up. And So I, I hate to see it, but I do agree with Blake. I think it is just about time for him to hang it up. I, I hope he can prove something to the Vikings and, and stick around for one more year. But let's be honest, this, this upcoming QB class is, is going to be outstanding, one of the best we've seen in a long time. So the Vikings might just be ready to move on and try to pick one of those guys up. Absolutely. And I was even going to ask both of you guys, if Kirk Cousins does happen to opt for one more year and doesn't stay with the Vikings, is there any location you think you can see Kirk Cousins maybe landing? It's tough to say right now. I feel like you got to wait to see how the rest of the season ends up because we could see trades happen. Um, that is true. You know, it's it's there's a lot of there's a lot of scenarios that that could pop up towards the end of the season, but let's let's keep that one in mind for sure towards the end of the season or even mid season when we're starting to see Definitely. stuff happen because who knows he might get traded mid season uh, with with all this talk coming up. So uh, yeah, like 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 we both said though, I like I like Kirk Cousins. I hope he can I hope he can stick around a little bit longer because I st- I think he's still got a couple more productive years in him. Um, but yeah, we'll we'll see what ends up. I mean, honestly, right now as it stands right now. Look over at Green Bay for him. Maybe maybe that's a decent place for him to land right now. Uh, you know, yeah. help help a young QB step into that role. 
Um, I don't know, I, but that's just one that pops up to the top of my, my mind. Yeah. Blake, is there anything that pops in the top of your mind? Nah, not for real. I mean, yeah. get, him, get him out. It's a new age, new era. I like yeah. it. Like, the only team I can physically think of maybe is just where he started. Go back to Washington. But just because I know during the long run, I mean, he was the one who got the big chance. You like that? But, I mean, <laughs> that was a long time ago. And then that, well, no one will probably forget that football memory for Kirk Cousins. But, I mean, guys, that's all we got for two minutes. Drill. Josh, back over to you. All righty, guys, let's jump over. Like I said, we're getting close to college football season. We've got some guys to look at. And shout out to 247 Sports. I'm going to have the link to their list in this in the description because I, I want to give them all the, all the credit for putting this together. I was trying to make my own list of guys to look out for. And whenever I found theirs, theirs was, theirs was really similar to mine. I, I had some different guys ranked different, but they almost had an identical list to what I was putting together. So I just used theirs because I... I personally liked theirs better. Uh, so, you know, just looking over at, at all these guys, and this isn't top 20 players for the, the 2024 season. This is top 20 guys to look out for. Uh, and so, again, shout out to 247 Sports. I'll have to look and see uh, if there's maybe a specific guy to, to give credit to over there. Um, but, you know, for sure, huge, huge shout out to them. We're going to start off with number 20, and we're each going to go through you know the the three different guys for each of us uh we're going to start off with blake he's got cj donaldson running back from west virginia blake what do we got to look forward for what why is he a guy that we can put in this top 20 list electricity man uh this is a guy that went off last year got hurt only played seven games uh but was the second leading rusher uh mountaineers uh uh, he is preseason uh first team all Big 12 uh, for the uh, Athlon Sports page, I believe, the, the magazine that comes out every year. Uh, and then I think Phil Steele had him as the second team, uh, All Big 12. So uh, he had, I think he had three games last year with multiple touchdowns scored. Uh, I think he averaged close to, I think it was eight yards a carry. Uh, I think he ended up with about, let's see here, 526 yards on the season, just on 87 carries. All right, like I said, uh, left the season, only played seven games, suffered a lower leg injury, uh, but an absolute workhorse in the backfield uh, for the West Virginia Mountaineers. He can also line up and catch the football, okay? He has experience playing tight end as well. So uh, this guy can do it all, man. Uh, C.J. Donaldson, an absolute playmaker. If you want to go back and watch the backyard brawl, the first game of the year last year, the highlight just absolutely pops on the kid, man. I think he went for like 125 against them or something like that with a touchdown. Uh, Dude's incredible. Uh, he- a heck of a playmaker, and um, hopefully he can be, you know, hopefully he can be something strong for the for the Mountaineers this year. I know this is do or die uh, for them this year. So, yeah, absolutely, yeah. So C.J. Donaldson, that is our number twenty guy uh, to watch out for. Again, huge shout out to Two Four Seven Sports. They're the ones that I actually stole their order. Um, just because I like the order that they put this in really well. I'm going to jump down to number 19 and give ourselves a little bit of a look at Braylon Trice, an edge rusher from Washington. When we think of Washington, we think of the Pac-12. As a whole, we think of their offense, uh, and it's it's tough not to think about their offense and, and think of everything that's going on over there. If you think of Washington, the first player that pops in your mind is Michael Penix Jr., thinking of how he can sling that, that, that rock around the field. But you jump over to the other side of the field, their defense – is strong enough to slow down any offense in the Pac-12. And a huge part of that is from Braylon Trice. I think looking over at him and seeing what he can put together last season, he had 39 total tackles, 23 of those were solo. Uh, And then, you know, just looking at at how how he was just constantly plugging the whole field and able to track down the ball wherever it was at. He wasn't able to get in his hands on any kind of turnovers, but just knowing what kind of player he is based on last year, uh, he had a huge breakout season last year, guys. Uh, so I'm looking at Braylon Trice. He had 10 sacks last year too, which is big. Uh, coming from the year before in 2021, he only had 14 tackles and uh, two sacks. 
So looking at Braylon Trice, the, the huge jump that he had going into the 2023 season was just phenomenal. Um, but then for him to jump forward now in, into this season, I think he's going to have another big jump. I think his numbers go up even more. Uh, you know, and Of course, this is all barring him being healthy, but I think he's a big player to watch. And I, I really like that they put him on this list because seeing, seeing where, he, where he stands, he's 6'4", 267 pounds. And the dude is just an animal. Uh, again, highlights, you go back and watch him from last season. I think he is is phenomenal. I'm, I'm really excited to watch him. Uh, he was a guy that when, when we were when we were uh, uh, trying to put guys into the system there at Oklahoma, I was really hoping to see his name jump into the, into the transfer portal. Uh, so Braylon Trice, another guy, number, number 19 for watching uh, for this upcoming season. But Jeremy, who do you got down there at number 18? Kicking it off at number 18, I got Eric Gentry, the linebacker at USC. Now, he's been honestly bouncing around his first couple of years of his college football career. I know his freshman year, he was over at Arizona State, then bouncing over to USC in a different territory. I know Arizona State, he didn't get a lot of time. Then now going over to USC, this man has not seen the sideline much on the defensive side of the ball. Like, he had 116 tackles, including nine tackles for loss, three sacks, five breakup pa- five breakups, excuse me, while only appearing in 23 games in t- starting 12 in 2022 season. Like, looking at the defensive side, he's a really, really big contribution to the USC's defense. I know we've obviously talked about USC before in past episodes. Like, USC and their defense, that's a big contribution for USC in general. Like, USC def- yeah, the UFC, UFC, USC defense with his first season of the Trojans, like I said, he played 11 games, started in nine of them. He racked up 71 tackles overall in the third on the team in tackles, and four of those for a loss of 19 yards or more, and two sacks for at least a loss of 15, two forced fumbles, three pass breakups. This man is definitely tracking on the stack sheet, guys, like, Within this upcoming year, like you mentioned, Josh, Pond staying healthy, you'll definitely be hearing this guy's name a lot. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and he's he's athletic too, so I'm I'm excited to watch him. Mm-hmm. But Blake, who do you got sitting there? Uh, let's see, where are we at? Number seventeen, right? Yeah, I got yep. Eric Gilbert, the uh, the the tight end that transferred to ne- to Nebraska for Matt Rule. Man, uh, this kid's six six, two hundred sixty pounds. He was a, a former five star that uh, went to LSU to start his career. Uh, I don't know what happened there, but he ended up transferring to Georgia, and then I think he tried to like transfer to Florida, and it got denied, so he went back to Georgia, uh, and then he spent the last two years there. Uh, just couldn't get on the field because of, obviously, what they had at tight end, but uh, he was a physically gifted freak coming out of high school. Uh, he's going to be over the middle of the field for Matt Rule, uh, he's got to utilize him. He's big bodied, uh, big hands, soft hands, can catch the football in traffic. Uh, expect a big year out of him. I know it's going to help. Uh, well, who's the kid at Nebraska this year? Is it, is it Phil Sims? Is their quarterback? Uh, uh, not Phil Sims. It's a yeah. uh, yeah, no. Sims. It's a man. If you uh, didn't ask me, I would have. I would have been able to tell you too. It's it's Sims. Um, he came from Georgia Tech. Yes. Uh, yeah. Um, hold on, hold on. I'm, not, I'm, not leaving. I'm not leaving. I'm not leaving. Jeff Sims. Jeff Sims. Jeff Sims. Jeff Sims. Jeff, Jeff Sims. Had, had, to, had to run through my brain real quick and pull it pull it together. Yeah. Jeff Sims. Yeah. From Georgia Tech. Yeah. So, uh, got to utilize him over the middle of the field. I think he could have six, seven touchdowns uh, for Nebraska this year. Just big body uh, can go up and get it in traffic uh, and and expect a big year out of him if he can stay healthy and stay out of trouble. Yeah, and, and Jeff Sims was another guy that I wanted to throw on the list too, but I just couldn't squeeze him in anywhere whenever I'm looking at the rest of these guys. Honorable mention for sure because another guy that adding to the roster, I don't think he's got that potential, but Matt Rule loves him. Uh, yeah. Josh Pate did a really good job with, with his interview with Matt Rule at, at Big Ten Media Days. And uh, yeah, looking looking at Jeff Sims, I think he has a lot of expectations. But uh, let's see, I guess it's my turn, right? So uh my next one is Trevor Etienne. I keep on wanting to say Travis Etienne when I think of this guy, but it's not Travis. This is a Florida running back. We are, you know, just we're, we are blessed to see another Etienne in college football. Uh, and this dude working it down at the Florida Gators. 
I mean, I, I think the Florida Gators are going to have to rely on the run game a little more this year. And if the spring game shows anything, so I went back to watch some spring game footage from him. And this dude is just, like like Blake said earlier with C.J. Donaldson, this dude is electric. He is very fast. Last year, he didn't even get a whole lot of workload. Uh, he had 118 carries, but he put up 719 yards. With, that's a six-yard average, guys. Uh, he was able to put six touchdowns in. He had an 85-yard touchdown as, as one of his, his touchdowns, and he can catch it out of the backfield. Uh, that's something that he didn't get to show off too much last year, but he showed it off in the spring game. And so the fact that, that they don't have Anthony Richardson, I think helps Florida personally. Uh, and I also think they're going to have to lean on Trevor Etienne a little bit more this year. So I'm really excited to watch him. I think he's got a lot of potential going into the season. I think he's going to be their workhorse. He's going to be the guy that they're going to have to lean on when they need to put up big numbers and, and games. And I think he's going to be easily a, a thousand yard rusher. I think he can, he can easily go into the double digits and touchdowns this year. This dude, I mean, like like I said, I think he's very electric, very fast, uh, and not only that, but he's just shifty, being able to find the find the holes, very patient. Uh, so I'm I'm really excited to watch Trevor Etienne down there in Florida. But Jeremy, who you got next? Going to number fifteen, I had Devontae Walker, the wideout receiver from North Carolina. Then I know we've obviously yes, heard the name Devontae Walker a lot with North. Carolina, but looking at before he was with North Carolina at Kent State, like he didn't get much of an opportunity to shine like he usually would now, like he does with North Carolina. Looking at his stats from when he was at Kent State, I didn't think this was right, but then I looked on a couple different pages. He only had one touchdown at Kent State and had five receptions for 124 yards. And looking at him now with North Carolina, Looking into the 2022 season, he had 58 receptions for almost 1,000 yards. I think it was 920 or 921 to be exact. And he's averaging 15.9 yards per game. This man is electric and he is fast. He can, he has really, really soft hands. He can definitely flat out burn you. I saw some of his highlights on Huddle. Man, this guy is the real deal. He can run a, he can run a chair route, he can run a quick hook route make you seem like you're silly and I'm paying attention, then this guy, he is definitely going to be the real deal once his time comes. I can easily see him breaking a thousand yards, if not having double, close to double digit touchdowns for this upcoming season. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's it's exciting. Uh, and, and I like I like that he comes from Kent State, too, because Kent State's an underrated program over there in, in recent years. Uh, so him coming over yeah. there with, with Drake May at North Carolina, whew. Watch out. I was surprised. It's yeah, absolutely. Scary. But number 14, Blake, who we got over there? Oh, we got Jatavian Sanders, the tight end from the Texas Longhorns. Uh, this offense is absolutely electric. This guy had 613 yards last year, five tutties, people. Uh, similar to Eric Gilbert in, in body size and, and uh, big physical fitness, uh, he's 6'4". I think he's around like 240 or something like that. Uh, a big fella that can get up oh, ac- over the middle, go across the middle, catch it, uh, nice soft hands, uh, can get into the end zone, going to be big for Texas inside the 20s, inside that red zone. Uh, and I think this is a guy that uh, Quinn Ewers can really rely on. This Texas team has a tough matchup week two in Tuscaloosa playing the Alabama Crimson Tide. Uh, hopefully they can stay healthy, but look out for Jatavion Sanders. Uh, should be a big year. I want to see – you got five tutters last year. I want to see about eight this year, and I want to see about 800 yards out of that tight end position. I know that Steve Sarkeesian can cook something up uh, down there in Austin, and uh, and he can put this guy in the best situations. Yeah, the only big dude and a big tight end that I can think of that's too much better than – than him would be Brock Bowers. Uh, I mean, just he's he's a monster and he's really good at blocking, really good at at, at fitting all over the, the place. But uh, moving down to number thirteen, I've got another defensive guy. I'm really happy that I got to bring up two defensive guys on this list already, and we've got more defensive guys to go down the list. But I'm going to bring up Braden Fisk, a defensive lineman at Florida State this year. So Fisk was the top ranked defensive lineman in two four seven sports transfer ranking r- r- rankings uh, for. A very good reason. <laughs> Looking over at him, he was phenomenal. Uh, last year, he was at Western Michigan, and he was named a first-team All-Mac. 
after registering. He had 58 tackles. Uh, so I mean, just a, a very good just being able to being able to put up that many tackles uh, in a season. That that's that's tough to do. So putting up over 50 tackles. Uh, so just watching him, and I think moving over to Florida State, we have a lot of expectations for Florida State over here at Rising to the Occasion. Uh, we, we expect big things from them, uh, and, and, and looking what, what uh, they're, they're putting together and seeing what Mike Norvell has done so far, I think he's going to do even better this year. I think their defense showed up very well last year. But now we've got uh, we've we've got Braden Fisk. He's coming in. He's a senior. This is going to be his fifth year playing in college football um, because of the COVID year. He's able to play another year here. Uh, and so we start off his first year. He had 24 tackles. Uh, moving forward into 2020, he had 23 tackles, um, but didn't see as much play time. And then in 2021, he had a big boost. It was almost double the numbers with 43 tackles, and he also had four sacks. Then last season, obviously, 58 tackles. Uh, and then he had six uh, six sacks and two forced fumbles and one force uh, and one fumble recovery. So not only his tackles, but also getting involved. But overall, just looking at a def- defensive lineman and seeing how big he is, 605, 305. Good luck trying to block him. Uh, it's going to take a big Dabo Sweeney lineman to try to keep and stop this guy. Uh, and I just don't see it happening. I think he's going to have another big year. I think him moving over from Western Michigan, moving over to Florida State was a very good move for him. Uh, I also think it was a huge move for for uh, for Norvell to, tr- to try to bring, bring him in and to add him to that, that defense and make them even stronger than what they are. So I'm very excited for Braden Fisk. I think he's got a lot of things going for him. Uh, so being able, to, being able to see him down at Florida State and help that defense out and Honestly, they've they've got a they've got a run at, at a national championship this year, and I think this is a very good opportunity for them. So I'm excited for Braden Fisk for that defensive lineman down there. Watch out for number 55 on the defensive line, a big boy. Uh, he's gonna be hard to stop. But uh, Jeremy, let's let's end it off with number 12 tonight. Who do you got? Number 12, ending it off. I had Jaden Bollard from Ohio State, the 6'2", 196 pound junior. Honestly. He hasn't had much targets in his career, only having nine receptions in his one rookie year, then having eight in his sophomore season on a total combination of 159 yards between two seasons. Like looking at his background, like he he needs to bulk up a little bit. I know he's on a little bit on the skinnier side, but his development is pretty good, especially coming to his lower body. Like he's all around a good athlete. Who excels, and he's even he's a double athlete. He also even excels on the basketball court, like when he was. Um, very natural. He was a very good natural pass catcher. He's not afraid to make the difficult catches, fight off defense, and just try and use his amazing speed just to get down. Then overall, he like I said, coming from Ohio State, you got such amazing talent coming from Ohio State. It's hard to throw to all these amazing talented players like obviously mentioning Fleming Johnson and there's so much more on the Ohio State roster that it's hard to specifically throw to one particular player at this time but I mean looking at him he's definitely got a lot of room to to grow and shine but we're going to obviously find out what he can truly do this upcoming season. Yeah, I think the biggest reason why he's on this list too, just thinking about it, because over at Ohio State, they're known for their wide receiving core, and we know that they're going to have Marvin Harrison Jr. We know that they're going to have Amika Agbuka, but uh, you know, obviously with them losing Jack- Jackson Smith and Jigba, who's going to step in to help that receiving core? Because you're going to need another guy in there, uh, and so who's who's yeah. going to be that third option? And I think this is a big season and a guy to watch out for because next year. You could see Marvin Harrison Jr. and Egbuka both leave and be. Marvin Harrison Jr. is for sure going to be a first round. Egbuka could possibly fall down to the second round. He could boost himself up to a first round. Mm-hmm. Uh, those two wide receivers are so good, so they could both leave. Seeing him step in, yeah, I, I like Bollard there. I like him at number 12, uh, watching out for him. So it's going to be exciting, guys. Uh, and so looking at all these guys on this list, too, I'm. I'm excited seeing all these these guys these these names that we look at for guys who aren't going to be the biggest names in all of college football, but guys that we can look at 
and see a little bit of expectations. So it's a lot of a lot of excitement going into the college football season. If you're ready for college football as much as we are, make sure to tune in on Saturday morning at 8.30 a.m. Central Standard Time. That's 9.30 a.m. Eastern Time. Tune in right here on YouTube. We're going to be here. We're going to be live early in the morning. You can jump in the live chat and throw in your suggestions. But for now, go ahead and comment down below uh, on this, this episode. You can hit that subscribe button. Hit that like button, too. We'll love to see the like button explode. So hit that like button. And obviously, as always, follow us on social media. We've got Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can follow us on TikTok, all of that fun stuff. So go show us some love, guys. And like I mentioned before, we've got a new Patreon account. So go check us out over on Patreon. That link is down below and you can help support us. We, we love you guys and thank you so much for all of your support. Uh, for an easy way, if you're listening on Apple Podcast or Spotify, you can give us a five-star review. That is a great way to help us out. Uh, again, thanks so much. We are growing, and it's all because of you guys, and we can only go further if you guys show a little bit more support uh, and maybe help some others find out about us. So, uh, guys, it's been real. It's been a lot of fun, but that's all we got for tonight. So until next time.